So, this is the future. Interesting. Well, good evening everyone. I must say, when I was told I'd be time traveling, I expected to see the future of Greece, not to land in Greece. However, I am not entirely to blame by Jove. Here are the top 10 reasons that I thought Greece was Greece. Number 10. When my agent said he booked me on a tour of Greece, I thought he said Greece. A natural mistake. Number 9. I thought I saw young people in togas and a group of Spartan warriors. It turns out they were wearing puddle skirts and leather jackets. Number 8. All the spontaneous singing and dancing made me think that I was near a Greek theater. Number seven. I saw chariots without horses. I'm a scientist here. Studying those things just was natural. Number six. One of the horseless chariots had lightning bolts on it. I naturally believed it to be a chariot of Zeus. No. Not me. I wouldn't drive anything that ostentatious. Number five. The sight of people eating in a diner reminded me of symposiums. Though I have been told that wine has been replaced by milkshakes. Those are, those are, those are pretty good, honestly. Have you ever tried a flavor called chocolate? Number four, hearing about a beauty school dropout and seeing a woman surrounded by other women in pink, I naturally believe them to be Aphrodite and her priestesses. She still owes me 10 drachma. Number three, watching a dance off at the local gymnasium made me think of the athletic competitions in ancient Greece. I tell you, Plato would have loved it. Number two, coming across what I thought was an open air play, it turned out to be something called a drive-in movie. Now, I, I think those are gonna be pretty popular in a few decades. And the number one reason I thought Greece was Greece is... Seeing this teenage drama unfold, I mistook it for a Greek tragedy. Okay, uh, I'm ready to go back. Send James Maynard in. Uh, hello? Hello? Anyone? What do you mean that chariot flies? That's ridiculous! Greece is the word. With Kenny Curtis and Jillian Hughes from Greeking Out from National Geographic Kids. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we're pondering why Greece is the word discussing the birth of science in the ancient world and what it still means for us today. Now, later on, we're going to be talking with Kenny Curtis and Jillian Hughes, hosts of the Greeking Out podcast. They're awesome. And they're also authors of a new book of the same name from NetGeo Kids. Now, once upon a time in the sunny lands of ancient Greece, more than 25 centuries ago, a bunch of curious folks decide to start asking some big questions. Why does the sun rise? What are stars? Why do planets move? Now they are tired of attributing everything to the whims of gods. Much like overgrown toddlers, they wanted answers and they wanted them now! Or, or then. Now, the Greeks had a knack for asking questions that were way ahead of their time. More than 2,500 years before our age, a woman named Aspasia was known for holding gatherings of some of the greatest minds of her day, including Plato and Socrates. A gifted conversationalist, 
Tales tell that she founded a school for girls, a groundbreaking advance for the era. Uh, Democritus of Abdura had many crazy ideas, including one that said that all matter was composed of individual bits, which we call atoms. Building on the work of his mentor one day around 425 BCE, he might have just been walking around, minding his own business, when he suddenly thought, what if everything's made of tiny invisible particles? Boom! Oh. The concept of atoms was born. Then there was Pythagoras, who had a thing for triangles. Now, he might have been sitting around one day doodling triangles in the sand when he realized that the square of the hypotenuse, that's the side opposite the right angle, is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Boom! Mind blown! And thus, the Pythagorean theorem came into existence. Now, during the 4th century BCE, keep up with me here, this is going to be a test later, Hippocrates took one look at, me at medicine and said, man, this needs some work. Well, not my words exactly, but yeah, sure. He insisted that diseases were not punishment from, punishments from angry gods, but had natural causes that could be studied and treated. This revolutionary idea paved the way for modern medicine. Now, not long after, a Noctisi of Athens practiced medicine dressed as a man, at a time when women were not allowed to be doctors. Now, thanks to her, laws in Athens preventing women for, from becoming doctors were overturned. Why, well, you're welcome. Now, it wasn't all work and no play for these ancient scientists. Oh, no. Legend has it that Archimedes discovered his famous principle while taking a bath. Oh no, not this story again, really. He noticed that as the water level rose as he got into his tub and realized this could be used to determine volume. He was so excited that he ran through the streets naked shouting Eureka, which means I found it. Now that's what I call a Eureka moment. The the birth of science in ancient Greece is a story of curiosity, ingenuity, and occasional naked sprinting through the streets. The ancient Greeks might not have had all the answers, but they sure knew how to ask some interesting questions. And with questions comes answers, and for a few of each, we're talking with Jillian Hughes and Kenny Curtis about their new podcast and book, Greeking Out from Nat Geo Kids. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Kenny Curtis and Jillian Hughes. They are the hosts of the Greeking Out podcast, and they have a new book, companion book out by the same name. They want to teach kids about mythology and history. So welcome to the show, both of you. So much great. Thank you. Yeah, great having you both on. So, um, just uh, like to get a little taste from both of you about uh, what got you interested in mythology and stories and legends and such. Jill, you want to go first? You, what got you into it? I was going to say, yeah, I know. It's a good setup. Well, little fun fact, Kenny is actually my father. Um, so my love of stories kind of came from him. Um, we joke that he, you know, used to be the best bedtime storyteller. 
Um, and it would tell me all these great tales and we would read together as kids. And that's definitely where I sort of um, fell in love with stories and storytelling and creativity and imagination and everything. So um, and mythology, you know, Greek mythology has just been around, obviously, for forever, but it ends up being in so many current present day stories. Um, I love Madeline Miller and Circe and Song of Achilles, all that stuff. So this has always been um, just a fun subject, something that I've really been interested in. Yeah, and uh, I grew up reading Edith Hamilton, the Edith Hamilton Greek mythology stories. I was, a, you know, kind of a D&D &D nerd as a kid before it was cool. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I have that, that background and, you know, I got into children's programming and when you get into kids programming and you're talking about storytelling and things like that, obviously Greek myths and mythology is so prevalent. I mean, really not just Greek mythology, but North Norse mythology, so many different myths. So, uh, you know, obviously it, it, it lends itself nicely. And we were fortunate enough to uh, cross paths with the folks at Nat Geo Kid and begin to start this podcast. Wow. And, you know, of course, you know, uh, let's face facts, Loki just makes any mythology more fun. <laughs> yeah. Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's always more fun with Loki. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's the tagline. <laughs> uh, so what is it that brought about the podcast? And how long? Tell us a little bit about the show and... How long it's been going on? Well, the podcast, it's interesting. The podcast started, this has been a weird evolution because it went from book to podcast to book. Mm -hmm. In There's a National Geographic Kids book series called Zeus the Mighty. Mm -hmm. And it's about animals in a pet shop. It's a kid's book series. And it's about animals in a pet shop in Olympia, Georgia, who think they are the Greek gods because the owner of the Mount Olympus pet shop listens to a podcast called Greeking Out. Hmm. And I was working at Sirius XM at the time. I still do work on the on the kids channel there. And we were talking about um, coming up with a fun way to promote that book series by actually making that podcast. And so we did. We sort of took it. I wound up working with Jillian and some other very talented producers and uh, got Perry Grip to do the theme song. And we created the podcast as sort of a marketing vehicle for that book series. But mm -hmm. the podcast took on a life of its own. After we're going on nine seasons now, it's become really, really popular in and of itself. And so uh, the popularity of the podcast led Nat Geo kids to say, hey, we should do a book based on the podcast. And here we are with epic retellings of classic Greek myths, greeting out the book right there. And how about you, Jillian? Have you always worked with your dad? Was that always cool or have you? <laughs> <laughs> it's never cool to work with your dad. Yeah, no, cool is not the word that I use. No, <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's been so much fun. Um, you know, it was kind of just a strange series of events that led us um, to work together on this. You know, the podcast came about like Kenny was saying, um, promotional opportunity for the Zeus the Mighty book at the same time that I was um, trying to build like a freelance career while um, staying home with my young kids. And he brought me on and yeah, it just sort of went from there. And I like to say that I'm like one of the only people that can write in Kenny's voice um, because I've heard it so much growing up. <laughs> so I am an expert in dad jokes. Um, have them down fast. And yeah, so it really was an easy transition. And it's just, it's so fun to be able to work with, with each other. And um, just, it really, you know, our family gets kind of sick of it because we kind of talk about work things at family functions and they're, you know, the boundaries are kind of blurred there, but it's really been fun. It's a dream come true for sure. Wow. And yeah. I like, so Kenny, do you have, I'd like to start with you, Kenny, but I'd like to get both of your views on this, is that I think mythologies certainly tie cultures together and our ways of exploring other cultures. Mm -hmm. So what do you both hope to that kids get out of this book and as far as mythology and story? I love the idea that a story can help you understand a situation. That narrative storytelling and that stories actually have a function in teaching both the reader and in some ways the writer or storyteller, how to actually empathetically understand the situation. 
really, if there's, you know, what do we always say? Be kind, practice kindness and stuff. But what we're really saying is we want empathy. We want our kids and our grownups to really get better at empathy. And storytelling, particularly the Greek myths, are so chock full of that because there are really no good guys in Greek mythology. Yeah, yeah. Zeus, whatever Zeus does, do just the opposite. Yeah, he's, he's a jerk. jerk. <laughs> yes, he's a jerk. He's a, you know, there is no benevolent God that is all seeing, all knowing, and all love. Ah, uh, these are vengeful, arrogant, uh, jealous. They have all of the bad qualities of humans as well as the good qualities of humans, uh, some more than others. So um, it, it, what's nice is that y- you have to, a- as a listener, you learn to to sort of judge, I won't say situational ethics, but you sort of learn to judge who to root for. Right. And you understand that characters and people are whole people. Everybody's bad and good. And I love the fact that that's a takeaway, not just in Greek mythology, but in the Mesopotamian myths, the Egyptian myths, the Norse myths that we get into, there's a lot of that all the way through uh, all of these sort of um, mythological um, cult, these cultures, the, mytholo- the mythologies in these cultures that have the same through line. And how about you, Jillian? You, what do you hope? Yeah. Yeah, you know, we always say that we obviously these myths have been around for thousands of years. Um, So these aren't original ideas or concepts, but what we do is kind of fill in the gaps and sort of provide like background information, kind of try to explain the character's motivation. Um, You know, we take creative liberties and try to really make these stories that have been forever around forever and these characters that have been around forever, we try to make them our own. Um, And we're trying to like encourage our audience to sort of do the same thing, you know, take these archetypes, take these characters and um, see how you can apply them to your own stories, your own imagination. Uh, Something we really liked about seeing the book was our illustrator, Javier Espia, um, his drawings. I mean, they're fantastic and they really, you know, bring these stories, these characters to life and just seeing his interpretations of the characters, what they look like. how he was fighting, you know, that kind of thing has been another level, another layer of storytelling. So we really just want to encourage our readers to fall in love with storytelling and make these characters their own as well. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's about providing context in a lot of ways. You know, our voice, our narrative voice in the show provides a very contemporary context to these stories. We explain the uh, the the myths in a very colloquial language. We still tell the stories in an adventurous, adventurous storytelling way, but we try to make them as relevant to kids today. But that doesn't mean that they aren't still universally relevant. We just want to try to make it a little easier for the kids to make the jump that Jillian's talking about between what I my life today and my world today and the message of this particular myth. Right. All right. And I think, you know, I think I was about to touch on that is that, you know, I, I think that it's so important that um, we're able to express these mythol express the motives and uh, motifs of these um, mythologies without without having people think that it actually exists, like may have happened right. in some of the earlier things. I mean, I'm not, you know, particularly concerned about, you know, tripping over Demeter on my way through a field, you know? <laughs> right. You never know. <laughs> you never know. I mean, it depends on the field, of course. Right. <laughs> but yeah. But of course, they still provide an amazing, I think, um, metaphor, amazing mm-hmm. metaphors for what, for life, don't they? Yeah. I mean, it's all about this, you know, there's a, a lot of trying to explain why life is so hard. I suspect that when these stories were first told, they were all sort of trying to make sense of the world around them. These were very early people and the way they entertained each other, but also the way they explained existence and why it got cold in the winter and stuff. They mm-hmm. they put it in the context of what they understood themselves. Maybe there's a really powerful person just like me up there. They didn't know meteorology. They didn't know weather patterns. They just know maybe there's somebody mean up there who has a lot more power than I do that's making it really cold. For- <laughs> you know, and so there is that, sure. But there's also the the um, idea of understanding different cultures and understanding different people. And Homer really gets into this. If you really want to geek out and get into or Greek out, 
and get into Homer and Hesiod and stuff, Homer does really steps into a lot of social commentary at, at various moments during the Iliad and the Odyssey, especially in the Odyssey. There's a moment where um, Odysseus in the Odyssey is stranded on an island with um, uh, Calypso, mm -hmm. and she's a witch. And he is he he spent seven years with Circe. He actually kind of fell in love with Circe, but Calypso has to use her magic to keep him there because he just wants to go home by this point. And um, it, Hermes comes and tells Calypso, "You got to let him go." And she says, "Why? All the male gods get to do this all they want. They get to keep women. They get to do all this stuff, but..." A woman, oh no, we can't have a boy toy, can we? And she, they, they, uh, you know, Homer points this out very clearly in the Odyssey. And, you know, obviously we we touch on that a little bit. For kids, we don't go too heavy in it. But it's an example of all of the kind of um, life experience and and still to this day relevant struggles that that these myths bring up. You know, we're still going through a lot of this stuff today. Absolutely. And Jillian, I want I just want you to introduce us to the Oracle of Wi-Fi. Oh, the Oracle. The Oracle. <laughs> Don't do the Oracle voice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the Oracle, uh, her job is to sort of come in and um interject some fun facts, some nonfiction information. And uh, she was created because National Geographic kind of has these sidebars in all their magazines, these like fun facts. And we wanted to incorporate that into the podcast. Um, and that's sort of how the Oracle came about. Um, and then over time, just writing her character, she just got sort of sassier and more witty and started, you know, calling Kenny out for his uh, bad jokes and all that stuff. So, yes, and she is kind of inspired by Alexa. He has the mm -hmm. Alexa voice. So, First yeah, thing I she's, thought she's a great character. Yeah. Such a great device. Uh, they, you know, Becky Baines uh, was an executive at Nat Geo Kids in the book division. She oversaw the kids' book division. And Kate Hale was a longtime editor. Uh, Kate edits the books, actually, as well. But uh, they came up with this idea with me once that, you know, we were, we just were having lunch together, kicking around ideas. And they kept talking about pop up video. Do you still remember pop up video? Oh, on yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The facts. Pop up video. Right. And they yeah. thought it might be fun to have like the audio version of that. So that's was the original genesis of that between that and the margin ideas. But, you know, when Jillian started writing these scripts, it really took on a life of its own. Kids love the fact that there's some odd and I don't even know how it started, but there's an odd fascination that the Oracle of Wi-Fi has with Snake. For some reason, she loves snakes. And the kids <laughs> likely post snake emojis on, on the <laughs> Apple TV reviews and stuff. For the Oracle, she loves snakes. And it's just, it's a really wonderful uh, sort of character that has taken on a life of its own and in some respects writes itself as you go. But mm -hmm. Jillian does such a great job with that voice. I'm thrilled. And it's a great way to sort of break up the tension of the story because, you know, these stories can be very gruesome. They can be a little violent. And just having the Oracle sort of interject. It just breaks the tension, lets kids know that it really is just, you know, a story and we're telling it, you know, it's not really happening. So it's a great device to use for lots of different reasons. That's fabulous. And so finally, uh, I'd like, I'd like to get this from both of you again, but starting with you, Jillian, if you could meet just one person, God, demigod, whatever, from mythology, who would you want to meet and what would you say? What would I say? Well, um, I would meet Cersei because she is a witch and she turns men into pigs. And it's just hard to top that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just love Cersei. I'm far to go. Probably just, you know, try to get some spells, like learn some witchcraft. Um I don't know. I don't need to be immortal. That seems like a long time, but uh, some basic spells would be cool. <laughs> sure, sure. Why not? Magicians never reveal their tricks, right? That's true. You know, that's true. <laughs> How about you, Kenny? Uh, I'm going to go with a lesser known mortal from one of the greatest stories of all time, um, the story of Heracles. A lot of people don't know that Heracles' mortal father is a guy named Amphitryon. Mm -hmm. And he was just a normal guy. 
just a normal guy who just wound up guy. having an amazing, amazing kid. And if I know nothing else, I know exactly what that's about because I get to write a book oh. with an amazing child. Ugh. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Right there. Right eat it up. Just eat it up. You'll love it. Uh, I do. I, I also would love to meet Chiron, who is the centaur, who is basically like the, the teacher of the gods or daycare provider, depending upon what age they were. But, you know, everybody from Jason to Heracles to uh, um, Achilles, they all were trained by Chiron. And he was he was pretty cool. So I would love to, to pick his brain. He's a good one. Excellent. Well, thank you both for being on the show. It was fabulous talking with you. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been great. And and uh, a big shout out again to Crispin Boyer, who wrote the Zeus the Mighty book series, which sort of, you know, uh, allowed all of this to happen. And uh, the book is uh, Greeking Out from National Geographic Kids. Yes. Check it out and check out their podcast, also named Greeking Out. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's have a talk about our friend Pythagoras, shall we? Remember him, the triangle guy? Yeah, yeah, well, well, his theorem is still used today in everything from architecture to video games. Yeah, you heard me right. Every time you play a game of Fortnite or Minecraft, Pythagoras is there making sure everything looks just exactly right. Next up is Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. Now, his idea that diseases have natural causes was a game changer. Today, doctors across the globe follow his principles. So the next time medicine helps you out, remember to say a silent thank you to Hippocrates. Uh, maybe skip the leeches and bloodletting? <laughs> I and who could forget Archimedes? His principle helps us design ships and submarines. And yes, he's the reason. His principle is the reason your bath water rises when you get in. So the next time you're enjoying a relaxing bath, spare a thought for Archimedes. And maybe keep the eureka moment to yourself? <laughs> what? Not again. Seriously. Last but not least, Democritus' atomic theory is at the heart of modern physics and chemistry. It's why we can build everything from skyscrapers to smartphones. So every time you send a text or take a selfie, remember that it's thanks in part to a Greek guy who lived over 2,000 years ago. So there you have it. The ancient Greeks might be long gone, but their discoveries are still very much alive and kicking. It just goes to show that great science never goes out of style. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we look at global warming. It's not just hot air. We'll look at the science of climate change and how our world could change in the coming decades. We'll be talking with Elizabeth Rush, author of The 21 telling the story of a group of young people using the legal system to help reverse climate change. Make sure to join us starting on the 14th of October, anywhere you see or hear the Cosmic Companion. While you're there, go ahead and do all that sharing and subscribing and following type stuff. Yeah, should be pretty cool to get. Yeah, pretty cool indeed. Clear skies.